Uh, we're going to be talking about classical guitar tonight, and I'm so excited, very excited to introduce to you our very special guest, Robert Thompson. Thank you so much, Thank Robert, you. for being here. Thank you. It is an honor to have you here Great with our little you. crazy little guitar family. <laughs> it's been fun so far. So. We, we don't get a chance to, to, to talk about classical guitar as much as, it, as it's in my heart to do so. So it is very exciting for me to have you here. Thank you, Steve. Um, um, we, we were connected by actually a, mu a mutual friend, uh, Jeff Cox, uh, who is the bass player for Earl Clue. And uh, I know Jeff because uh, he teaches out at the university that I teach. And how do you know Jeff? Jeff actually used to have an association with Belmont. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, and uh, he attended a few of my uh, <laughs> concerts. Just move it if you can. Yeah. He attended a few of my uh, concerts over at Belmont, and I'm a big fan of his playing. You know, yeah. fantastic players. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, let's get let's get right into it. Um, hey, can you play us something? What are you going to sure. play for us? Well, uh, this is a classical guitar I'm holding in my hands. I'm going to start off with something that's a little bit kind of crossover. Uh, one of my big influences, uh, I'm going to try to bring up some of my influences throughout the evening, uh, was a recording that Manuel Barueco came out with a few years ago called Some Time Ago, where mm -hmm. it was kind of a crossover record. Mm -hmm. And it really affected me as a player, and just uh, I learned several of the tunes off of there. I'm going to start off with a Chick Corea comp composition entitled Children's Song Number 1. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and with a capo. You don't normally see a classical guitar played with a capo. Yes. Um, I think the reason for the capo in this arrangement is just to, the, the original piece is actually pretty far up the neck. Mm -hmm. And to try to get the sound just a little bit more. You know, you can play it down here. But it's not yeah. quite the same. Yeah. yeah. Your guitar gets such a beautiful sound. Um, such a sweet, warm tone. Thank you. Uh, tell, us, tell us about that instrument. Sure. Uh, this is a Canadian instrument by uh, the Canadian maker uh, Douglas Scott. And uh, I acquired this instrument a couple years ago. It's uh, European spruce and uh, wingé, which is an African blackwood on mm. the backs and sides. Just so, gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Well, you've had such an amazing career of playing and uh, here in even here in Nashville where it's not known for its classical guitar work uh, right. you've played at the Skirmerhorn you've played at the Ryman um, tell us a little blessed. bit about how'd you get started did you come from a musical family I did uh, my mother was um, always kind of got together and played folk music I'm told um, with her relatives and stuff so they were folk musicians and then uh, I went to music school of course mm -hmm. and uh, where did you go to I, I went to school at uh, Ball State University, which mm -hmm. is in northern Indiana, and uh, then went to Southern Illinois University for my uh, some of my master's degree. Fantastic. Yeah, so. Fantastic. Yeah. And I read somewhere that along the way, you were uh, had played through the uh, Montreux Jazz Festival. Yeah, that was kind of an unusual experience in uh, 1985. I'd been playing in my college jazz band. And we, we had done pretty well that year. We had a great uh, saxophone section, trumpet mm -hmm. section. And I, a little bit of good fortune, too, I must say. The, uh, the guy that had been playing in the top jazz band, uh, unfortunately, had failed out of school. So I was in the second A jazz year. musician yes. failing out of school. <laughs> heard it's of hard to believe, <laughs> I know, but try and wrap your head around it. So, uh, you know, I auditioned for the first band, and he was really the only person that I was concerned about. And so when he was out, I thought, well, I have a good shot of getting in there. So that year, I got in the first jazz band at uh, college, and it just so happened we won a, a small competition up in Chicago. And then we actually were one of three bands that year to be invited to the Mantra Festival. 
Absolutely and, incredible. Uh, that what was, an honor. Yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, I look back on it now. I mean, Miles Davis was there, Joao Gilberto, uh, oh. and uh, Astor Piazzolla. <clears throat> I mean, just all these great players, many who are deceased now, you yeah. know. But yeah. Miles Davis, you know, that was quite a exciting time. Now, but now your your musical journey has taken you into a classical into the yeah. classical world. When did you start uh, getting familiar and falling in love with classical playing? Well, I was um, I was ten years old when I first started playing the guitar, and mm -hmm. I started actually with a jazz teacher. And um, one of the first things I did when I first started playing the guitar was I was kind of um, hired before I even could play to play a wedding, you know. Mm -hmm. So the jazz teacher um, learned I, I learned six tunes for the wedding, you know. <laughs> And uh, I forget what they were, uh, just the way you are. And, there you uh, go. Just the two of us and all kinds of, you know. That's right. And I, I kind of crammed those down pretty quickly. And uh, there was also a classical player, a well-known classical player in my town. And uh, I, w I was always fascinated with it. You know, I mm -hmm. started listening to Julian Bream recordings when I was very Julian young. Julian Bream, yeah. And uh, I, I would go to our public library and, and check out vinyl records, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things where... Um, when I heard I could study some classical, I thought, well, that'd be a, a good thing. And so I kind of kept up with both for a while. And then when I went to college, I decided to major in classical guitar. So Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Beautiful. Um, all right. Well, let's talk a little bit about classical guitar and classical guitar technique. Sure. Um, uh, let's first talk about probably right and left hand technique. Yeah. We've been discussing that the last week. And uh, um, tell us about... How, your approach to right and left hand technique. Okay, well, with the left hand, um, with just classical guitar technique in general, uh, you do want to, uh, camera's there, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, you do want to try to minimize your motions as much as possible and to you know streamline all the excess, excess uh, motions in the right and the left hand mm -hmm. and work efficiently. Uh, the left hand in particular, a lot of mm. rock players you know or blues players will start off in this position, which yeah. I think for that style, you know there are probably some benefits to that. But uh, for what we do, um, the thumb works best behind the neck right. because we're playing a lot of stuff like this, you know, where you have to have the hand pretty wide open, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then with the right hand, the right hand, there are so many uh, viable techniques, but the main thing with the right hand is you want to, I'm going against the Segovia audience mm -hmm. right now, but the right hand, you want to keep fairly straight. Um, if you're making a fist with the right hand, mm -hmm. um, it's very comfortable because you're ergonomically, you're using mm -hmm. your hand. But if you go down like this and it's very uncomfortable, painful, mm -hmm. it can lead to some injuries. And then if you come back up. So you're talking about straight as opposed to the, this, this plane of the arm yes, and, the, really and coming over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe just, you know, and relaxing the, the very end of the arm. But n Segovia uh, was very extreme with that, you know. Right. And uh, it worked for him. Nothing against what he was doing at all because uh, it worked for his hands. And uh, many of his protégés, though, went on to um, have hand injuries, yeah. you know, because they were trying to uh, use that same playing position. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The main idea is just... You want to be comfortable. You're going to be yeah. playing a lot. So <laughs> a lot. any any time you put any sort of extra movement, extra pressure, um, an exaggerated movement, well, you times that by 20 years, and you're, you're going to end up with some, with some issues. So the least amount of movement um, that you can have in, your, in, your, in either hand is what you're going for. You're a guitar player. The least amount that you can do <laughs> is always your goal. So... Um, but it's the same thing. It's relaxing is the key. You know what? You're going to be busy enough playing guitar to have movements that are stressful because you're in an odd position. That's right. Yeah. And you mentioned already that you know you're doing this a lot. You know, so you want to make sure you're not doing anything to injure yourself. That's right. You know, that's the the main goal. That's right. So, um, as you have questions out there, I see some of them are already starting to come in. Um, Type them in. If you can put them in all caps, that, that helps us know which ones are questions and which are not. We know you're not shouting at us. It's just easier for us to see that way. I see Nacogdoches Bob is saying, Robert, when playing notes within a, a range of the fifth to seventh frets, uh, position, uh, what do you key on to keep your thumb in a good position? I'm not sure if it's right hand or left hand thumb, but I probably... Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, well, 
in the left hand, um, I generally try to keep my thumb between, behind the neck, uh, between the second and third finger, second, just so third. it's balanced. If I were holding a pencil, uh -huh. you know, sort of like this, where there's not a whole lot of pressure, it's more actually just balancing, uh -huh. you know, in the uh -huh. left hand. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, can you can you play us something? Sure. I will play something that actually, uh, I guess, is more of a student-level piece. I'm going to play a little bit of it. I don't even know. I'll play the whole thing. This is uh, Fernando Soar. Uh, it right. used to be numbered um, Soar Study number 7, I believe, in the Segovia edition, but it's actually Opus 35, number 17. And um, I'll play just a little bit of it, and then we'll discuss some of the reasons why this. I, I feel like this is a very important piece, yeah. and I make all my students do this. So. Because um, this piece is a great piece for many reasons. I feel like it actually has a wonderful arpeggio with a melody kind of woven into it. Right. And uh, a lot of players um, are these days are working out the rest stroke. Mm -hmm. But many times, uh, even today, we still use rest stroke in a piece like this to bring out the melody. Starts here. stroke for those of you who don't know yeah, perhaps what that is um, is when we actually it's called a puyando in Spanish it's a supported stroke where you're actually playing across the string and resting on the adjacent string so if I'm playing on the first string for example I'm actually resting letting the stroke and going into the second string as I'm playing through that or if I'm playing on the second I'm resting on the third and uh, it's a string that allows a little bit more power because you actually have a stopping point. Right. You can put a little bit more energy into it. It also, you don't want to do too much or you kind of wind up with false accents, but it is uh, a technique that can be used, you know, even in something like a piece like that where you have the melody on top. Beautiful. So um, it's, it's a technique that's very viable. Um, even in some of the more advanced literature like I'm using it every once in a while just to kind of push the melody out a right. little bit further. You know? What was the name so. of that piece? Capriccio Arabe by, by Francisco Tarrega. By Tarrega. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tarrega. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the sore piece that he mentioned, I'll try and put that up on our discussion board um, so that you can take a look at that and uh, play around with that. It's a beautiful piece. Uh, Miguel uh, Miguel Cruz is saying, "Do you position the thumb in the middle or down lower on the neck, as far as in, where it is on the back of the neck, of which we don't have a camera back there?" Um, um, it's usually sort of in the middle, unless there's an extreme reason. Like if you're up here, of course, you know um, some of the higher position stuff. Obviously, my thumb has to be. There's no way to be right behind. Right. But in in general, if you put a piece of double-sided tape down tape down the back of the neck, uh, that's a good reference point uh, mm -hmm. for like a center, you know, yeah. in the back. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Great questions. Um, beautiful. Beautiful stuff. Now, I also read somewhere that you had uh, done some tracks for the London Symphony. That was kind of unusual, and that was um, several years ago. I was uh, at my place one Sunday, and I got a... Um, Actually, this is before cell phones. Uh -huh. I, I got a call, and someone said, can you play scales at 160? And I said, 16th notes? <laughs> I and, I, and I said, I think so. I, I practice that way. And, and so uh, the guy goes, well, if you can do that, I, I need for you for a session tonight. You know? and he didn't t give me much information. He goes, you'll be playing with the symphony. And I said, okay. Are they going to be there? You know, uh -huh. or, and I was my biggest fear was I was going to show up and he was going to try to record the Rodrigo concerto or something. You know, All I right. didn't know. I said, well, he goes, no, it's just an arrangement. You know, I've done so out in Brentwood. Um, the tracks were pre-recorded in London, and then they, you know, had flown them to him at that point. Um, technology wasn't so good. And you were earth. you were just yeah, uh, I just overlaid the track on, did, with the symphony. Yeah, yeah, of so, just a background part or something. Well, it was actually. Um, it was a pretty intricate part, as I recall. It's been several years ago, but uh, it was done in like an hour, hour and a yeah, half, you know. Yeah. But he was a great producer. I, his name escapes me right now. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I remember hearing the story. You never know what you're going to 
fall into as a musician. Sometimes you go into recording sessions and, uh, uh, you know, you, you kind of know what's going on and it's a regular track and you're just laying down some guitar stuff with it. Um, I remember Michael Omardian, the great producer Michael Omardian, um, he said he got called for one session and uh, he plays keyboard and he said, I, I get into the session and there's a grand piano in the <laughs> middle of the room with just stacks of music all around it and the orchestra all around and they were and I was to come in and read this elaborate <laughs> piano featured piece with orchestra and he said I was never so terrified in my life. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that would be a very scary session. <laughs> Sometimes see I heard that uh, uh recording uh, studio guitarist, it's 98% uh, boredom and 2% terror of <laughs> trying, to, trying to do all that. Well, great. Uh, now, currently, you are on the guitar faculty out at Belmont University. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Here, uh, mm -hmm. literally, around the corner. <laughs> the corner. Uh, it's, we're here in Nashville. We have all these famous places around. And then uh, Middle Tennessee State University. Are you still I, on the I am faculty on the faculty, faculty there? there, yes. Yeah. Um, I was uh, the main professor out there. Uh, Dr. Bill Yelverton was on sabbatical last semester, mm -hmm. so he graciously allowed me to run his program, and I, I was very flattered, and uh, we had a lot of fun, and he's back now, so uh, hello, Dr. Yelverton, <laughs> and uh, thanks for entrusting your whole guitar program to me for a well, semester. Well, um, I, I can speak so highly of it because um, I am familiar with the Belmont Guitar Ensemble and the work that is going on over at MTSU, yeah, which some is great just stuff. beautiful yes. classical guitar players coming out of that program. Excellent. And uh, from knowing the work that is going on over there, I can tell there must be some really great classical instruction going on over there. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. We, um, we have a really great batch of students, you know. Uh, sometimes, um, I don't know, it, the vibe of certain schools is always a little bit different, you know. Uh -huh. but the students really make the program, you yeah. know, and uh, it's the spirit. And uh, of course, at Belmont with the Belmont Guitar Ensemble, uh, which I've been directing now for about 20 years, mm -hmm. has just been, um, we've had some great students in there throughout yeah. the years. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. I've I've heard you on the radio. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, with, yeah, we uh, uh, recently did Live in Studio C, which studio is a Nashville-based yeah. television yeah. or radio show here. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. If someone wanted, if we're mainly talking to adult guitar learners and um, yeah. if someone wanted to get started into playing classical, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are some tips that you might give them or of some things to start? I know, I mean, I know that classical gets as complex as you want to go. Right. Um, but for the, for the average player who just kind of wants to, who appreciates sure. it and loves that sound, where would, where would a good place that they could start? Um. Well, I think the big question you have to ask, you know you have to find out first is is uh, does the student read music or not mm -hmm. you know because music can sometimes uh, I think scare people off mm -hmm. you know if the, if I tell a student we're, we're going to learn classical guitar it's like you immediately see the fear of like oh no I'm really going to have to read music now you know guitar players um, unfortunately don't grow up like violin players and pianists where those musicians are always like from a very young age playing in orchestras mm -hmm. and you know they're reading music in large groups and mm -hmm. um, guitar players learn Jimi Hendrix songs yeah. you know in yeah. their bedroom yeah. or whatever you know so um, to get into classical, if you're already playing, I think the main thing is to really be aware of what we discussed earlier, is the refinement of your technique and mm -hmm. the economy of motion that re is required. And I really feel like, you know, there are a lot of online programs that are very good, mm -hmm. but I feel like for the first six to eight months especially, if you're just starting off, you might want to hook up with a, a teacher because uh, it's real important that they watch your hand positions and mm -hmm. also, you know, or give you one-on-one -on -one advice. Right. You know, so. And a lot of the classical guitar instructors are in universities. Um, so don't be afraid to contact them though either because a lot of these guys will teach on the side as well and uh, you're just not going to find probably down at the local mm -hmm. music store uh, someone who's uh, an accomplished classical guitarist. Um, so you usually have to go to more of a university scholastic setting for that. But uh, do some research in your area and uh, find out, you know, Nickel's worth of searching on uh, on Google, and you'll find out at the local university who's their classical guitar instructor, and then try and track them down, and um, get some see if you can get a lesson or two from them. 
lots of great resources. Yeah, and the wonderful thing about, you know, YouTube and all these online sites, such as your show, mm -hmm. even, you know, you, I, I know when I was growing up, you didn't have those resources and you would literally have to seek out, you know, another person. But many of my players that come in, the students will actually tell me they've watched YouTube clips, you know, yeah. before they come for the audition. Because they come, you know, they may start off as rock players or jazz players and they may just need enough to get through the program, you know. Right. Um, so YouTube, I think, is a viable thing yeah. as long as you're not watching the wrong videos. On, yeah, you know, that's stuff right. Too. Who are some of the great players that uh, in, in the classical uh, genre that folks should be listening to? Um, well, of course, you know, we could go back to, I guess we'll go as far back as Segovia, mm -hmm. you know. There are obviously many fine players that existed before him. Uh, but Segovia, uh, I grew up listening to Julian Breen, mm -hmm. who's actually still alive, mm -hmm. uh, although he's retired. God, he's got to be 90 or something. I think he's. Uh, I think he turned 80 just a few years ago. Yeah, really. I mean, he's like 83 probably yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then of course uh, some of uh, the, the Romero's family. You yeah. Know? Pepe uh, Romero. Pepe Romero, Angel Romero, um, and then you know some of the more current players, Manuel Barueco. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I do a lot of duo, duo playing. So uh, the Assad guitar duo, Sergio and Odea uh -huh. Assad, uh -huh. um, are sort of uh, a nice reference point, although yeah. uh, completely not human <laughs> as, as players. You know. um, yes. Brilliant players. Uh, Randy120 is asking, do you play any other instruments? I was required to play piano in uh, college, which uh -huh. I passed my uh, audition. And uh, I also was required to take some string technique courses. And yeah. I, I have played mandolin and banjo in show, the show Chicago and Anything Goes. Yeah, you know? that's right. I saw uh, that you've done some Broadway But I do work. not claim to be <laughs> a virtuoso on either of those instruments yeah. because they're, they're... It's a different animal. Yes, yeah, it, it was basically survival to get through the show. Yeah. So. I was so pleased mentioning banjo. Uh, I was watching Keith Urban a night or two ago on Jimmy Fallon, and he was playing... A git Joe, I think, <laughs> is uh, so it was a banjo looking thing, looked exactly like a banjo, it had six strings and <laughs> tuned like a guitar. You so go. you could play guitar things on it and it gets this banjo esque sound. And I thought, oh, well, that's brilliant because banjo is tuned so differently from it the is. standard guitar yeah. that it really is a different, um, different animal. Um, so many great questions. Let's answer one more and then we'll talk about some. Uh, uh, resources and things. Uh, B. Fitzpatrick 24 is saying, are there standard pieces of music that all classical guitarists should know? Yes. Yes, the answer to that <laughs> yes. is, a, is <laughs> an emphatic just... yes. Well, it's, I mean, you know, I guess it's sort of like any style, you know, if you were going to play bluegrass or if you're going to play jazz, you know, there's going to be a core group of pieces that you are going to need as rudimentary, you know, pieces and, and good studies. One at Belmont that we do um, are some of the... Uh, Carcassi and Caruli Andantinos, right. and they're very, I say they're simple pieces. Actually, they're pretty complex if you're completely starting, but something like this, you know. And so forth, you know. Uh -huh. So, I mean, those pieces um, are nice pieces because they require considerable about of a right hand technique and also um, you know you can set up your technique and you can kind of not be too worried about it so you can actually get in front of a mirror right. or on your phone and actually watch and make sure your hands are doing what they should be doing right. and you know the left hand here is also kind of crucial because um, and then you go play some thirds you know So pieces like that. Um, there's a tremolo piece by Carcassi. That's another one that yeah. most students do. Yeah. Uh, the the soar piece I mentioned. Uh, there's some really wonderful Leo Brower studies that yeah. are also great. The 20 simple studies, uh, which have just recently been re-edited yeah. by Brower. So yeah. there's so many though. And then of course the goal ultimately I think is to finally get to play a piece by Bach or yeah. you know, something like that. But yeah. That's down the road. Renaissance yeah. music's nice, too, because it's not quite as difficult, you know, uh, as 
you know, Baroque music, right. uh, when you're first starting, I mean, you can mm -hmm. play very advanced Renaissance pieces, but, um, yeah, so it's a long answer, but yeah. you know, there's a lot of great pieces. There. All right. Well, let's talk about some of the, <clears throat> talk about some of the resources that we have going on for this uh, month. Speaking of those pieces, um, I had put together, did a little bit of research and I wanted to put together a great series of resources for classical guitar. We don't get around to classical guitar very much here on the show, unfortunately. Um, maybe we need to do that more. I think we do mm. need to do that. I'm enjoying it just a little bit too much. Mm. Um, so I put together a smattering of great pieces. One of them is Pumping Nylon by Scott Tennant, uh, founding member of the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. If you're not familiar with the LAGQ, uh, you need to go onto YouTube, and type in Los Angeles uh, Guitar Quartet and enjoy. Um, he wrote this, and this has kind of become um, a little bit of a textbook for te classical guitar technique. He did it, I don't know, way back when, 15 years ago. It has been recently revised. This is the second edition, which came out, I don't know, two months ago. So um, it is great. So it has everything that the original had in it, plus it comes with a DVD, updated DVD. The other one was great, but it was a little dated, yeah. a little dated. And uh, so now it's a great uh, video of him explaining all these techniques, which is invaluable to have one of the best classical players in the world sitting there telling you, this is how you do it. Um, plus, what I liked about this is it has the old Giuliani studies, the right hand and the left hand studies are in here. Um, so I like that. So that's part of it. The other thing, um, Robert had mentioned the, uh, it's helpful, sometimes the music reading can get intimidating for, for players that are coming in, and a lot of classical guitar music is done in purely music notation. So after a lot, way too much searching, I found this book, um, The Guitar Tab Classical Favorites, 50 of the standards of classical guitar. There's Bach in here, there's um, other classical guitar, uh, uh, composers, um, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, a lot of things that you would be familiar with, uh, songs that you would be familiar with in the classical, uh, just classical music repertoire adapted for guitar, and it's got the tab, so all of you tab people can be happy about that. So uh, it comes with two CDs, so you get a reference of everything that's going on with that. Um, and the last book was, uh, unfortunately I don't have it here with me, is a book called Classical for Guitar. It has a lot more of the Spanish composers. It's got some Bach pieces in there as well, but they're more beginner to intermediate in how it's approached. And they uh, have tab as well with those. If you're interested in those, we got a great deal going on them. Um, Fabian, you can put up the link for that. And uh, these are great resources. Sometimes I don't feel as strongly about that we're offering really super resources or I'm able to get what I wanted. This time I was able to get exactly what I wanted. These are fantastic resources. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about this style, playing some of the music, learning about the technique, check out the uh, classical resources that we have going on this month. All right. Hey, we got our Guitar Gathering Conference coming up in June, June 22nd through the 25th. It gets better every day. Um, we booked Phil Kage to be our live lesson guest on, um, for the conference. Uh, usually we have our live lesson on Friday of that week. This time we moved it to Wednesday of that week to be able to accommodate all the people that are going to be here at the conference. So it's going to be great. Um, and you know what really bums me out? This is what bums me out. I got an email yesterday from our good friend Ian Ethan Case. Oh, I was telling you about him. Uh, remember the guy we had, I don't know, four months ago, four or five months ago with the double neck guitar? He just happens to be coming through town. He said, hey, Steve, I'm coming through. Um, if you're interested, oh, man, I would have loved to have him. Maybe we'll get him to do a workshop. I don't know. We'll see if we can get him to do that. Um, anyway, it's going to be great. If you're interested, the conference is uh, coming up. Um, we're full, but there's always room for one more. So if you're interested, check it out. Um, oh, and the, and the last thing I have down here is it's summertime. Um, and so my schedule is a little bit more freer these days. If you are interested, some, I do Skype lessons occasionally. Uh, I have a couple of Skype students that, that uh, we do lessons with. If you're interested in uh, getting some private lessons with me, summer's kind of the better time to do it because I'm just not so busy. Um, I, do the, I put the link there so Fabian can throw up the link if you're interested. 
Um, you can get it through the website, and then we work on a time, and, uh, and then we just go back and forth, and we do some Skype lessons. So it's a great way to kind of check on your technique and uh, things like that. So there you go. If you're interested, uh, check it out. Hey, let's give something away. I want to give away, this is one of your CDs that from is, one of your duos. That's right. Yeah, that came out about a year ago, mm -hmm. and that's uh, my guitar duo that I have with a gentleman named Joey Butler, mm -hmm. and uh, we play Latin, mostly Brazilian and uh, Latin music. Yeah. I put one of the links to it on our discussion board for this live lesson. Just brilliant stuff. So someone is about to win this. The winner um, of this is... Coming. It is still coming. Yes, the winner of this is F. H. Marshall. F. H. Marshall, you have just won this CD. If you would be so gracious to autograph this before, course, we, before yeah. you go, that would be great. Be uh, of beautiful classical guitar music. Fantastic. All right, enough of me yabbering on. <laughs> um, can you play something? Sure. Yeah. Look. I'll move to Brazil now, I'll play a piece by um, a composer named Gilarmando Hayes, and this is a piece called Se, Se a la Purgenta. <laughs> Beautiful. It's kind of a reduced version. I know we're kind of limited on time, so yeah, I, I took out no, a couple of repeats. That's, gosh, it's just, it's making me fall in love with classical guitar again. You know, I, I came in, like many of your uh, students, unfamiliar with classical guitar. I was a jazz player, mm -hmm. playing jazz in clubs, and mm -hmm. I got, my, got myself through college that way, but I got into college and I had to do classical guitar. It's the only program they had. Unlike today, where they have got these amazing, Belmont being one of them, commercial guitar programs yeah. um, that are, are so advanced. Our school at that time, I went to the University of Texas at San Antonio. Sure, and, great school. And um, we had uh, classical guitar was all we had. Now I played in the jazz band and things like that, sure. but classical guitar, if you want to be a major, it was all the <laughs> classical guitar. So I bought this guitar and um, learned about crazy things about hand position that I, now I use every day. Sure. And, uh, yeah. you know, learned about uh, Giuliani studies and Segovia scales and all these wonderful things we put uh, classical guitar majors yeah. through. Um, well, I think a lot of jazz players, I know the, the jazz players we have at Belmont, you know, uh, they're a little hesitant to start playing classical guitar. You know, I mm -hmm. don't know, maybe they're afraid that it's going to de-jazz de -jazz them or something. Yeah. But once they figure out that they're actually going to be uh, using the hands more efficiently and can, mm -hmm. you know, do more, yeah. um, they're... They're totally game, and you know. I mean, I really I was exactly players. that same same way. Yeah. I did not. I was not interested in classical at all. It was just kind of if you wanted to be a major, you had to do it, and uh, so I uh, didn't like it the first several weeks. But once we got a month or two into it, then I found this love for this music I didn't I had never really listened to before. Right. Yeah. There's so much wonderful music. I was going to say, even if um, I know some of the more traditional pieces, sometimes kind of um, I don't know can turn some 
people off, you know, a little bit. Mm -hmm. But there's so much great repertoire out there. It's hard to imagine that you couldn't find something, you know, mm -hmm. that you would just fall in love with, like you just said. Right. You know, whether it be Latin, Bach, um, you know, I love all of it. So, yeah. but um, I know a lot of my students kind of lean one direction. Yeah. You know, so. I know for me, <clears throat> I mean, I play a little bit of classical guitar. I, 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 I uh, but when I hear really great classical guitars, it just, it, it stirs something in my heart about it. And, uh, I mean, there's nothing I like at the end of a stressful day to come home and whip out a little classical guitar piece, a Bach piece or something like that, and just kind of play to kind of calm my, my heart down a little bit from the stresses of the day. It's something about just the style of the music. Um, for others, it may be, you know, you may be turning on your death metal, and that, and that does mm -hmm. it for you. For me, I don't know, a, Bach, a little Bach piece does it for me. So, um, <clears throat> All right, we've got a couple more uh, questions. Um, Tom Moore is saying, how do you feel about using a thumb pick for classical? Well, I think for certain styles, it's uh, it's mandatory. You know, it's required. Like if you're going to do the Chet Atkins, you know, or yeah, the Travis, Merle Travis, yeah, yeah, Travis style picking, it's you know, um, I've experimented with that from time to time. I kind of like you know more of a traditional thumb sound, but uh, you know, if I were doing that style, I would definitely look into it. Yeah. Talk to us about your nails uh, okay, and nail sure. care a little bit. Um, okay. Um, kind of sh kind of show us. Maybe we can get a shot of it uh, through this camera <laughs> sure. there. Um, well, um, the main thing is uh, you don't want them too long. I think, uh, I know in the 70s, when I, uh, late 70s, when I was taking classical guitar, I remember the gentleman I was studying with, he had very long nails, you yeah. know. And I thought, wow, I have to grow my nails really long. But the trend these days is actually uh, a shorter nail. And uh, the goal, if you're looking at your hand, I don't know where the camera is. It's right going to be, he's okay. going to be getting you over here. Okay. So, if you're looking here, the left side of the nail, which is going to be over here, um, this side of the nail is going to be the, the contact point with the string. So you want a nice blend of flesh and nail on the string. Mm -hmm. If you get too much nail, yeah. it's going to sound really thin. Um, not that you don't want that sound every once in a while, but, um, and so I'll go back to sort of the Scott Tennant thing. I'm borrowing mm -hmm. probably a few lines from his book, but um, you want to ramp the nail more than just you know, if you follow the contour of the end of the finger, um, you actually, the, the string hits the nail and it ricochets off of it too soon. Right. And, and here, you can actually, the nail is staying on the string a little longer, which allows you to shape the sound, whether you're wanting a brighter sound. It still should be a really rich, you know, right. tone. Mm -hmm. So, Beautiful. And um, my nails right now, I just happen to have all my real nails. Um, but I think, you know, uh, in the winter months, uh, using some kind of uh, nail oil or hand lotion mm -hmm. rubbed into the cuticles and, of course, taking care of your body just in general doesn't mm -hmm. hurt. Yeah. But um, the nails really, uh, I think even acrylic nails, which I know some people resort to, I think they're great for emergencies and stuff, but I, I feel like the real nail is always going to sound a little warmer. And, you know? and, and it just feels more it feels natural, natural yeah. to it. Um, fantastic, fantastic. Um, uh, Rockin' Rick Rickard is saying, what brand of guitar are you playing? This is a uh, 2014 uh, Douglas Scott guitar. He uh, resides up in Canada, I think on uh, Vancouver Island. Somewhere. Does he have a website? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got a great website. don't know the name of it, but if you Google, it's Douglas Scott. It's uh, Douglas, D-O-U-G-L-A-S-S. Uh, and then Scott, as you would normally spell Scott, S-C-O-T-T. -T. If you Google that and guitar maker, I'm sure that would come up. Fabian, we'll give you approximately seven seconds, and you'll have that link up there for us. <laughs> the fastest hands in the West there <laughs> are wonderful unpaid moderator, uh, Fabian, who is more faithful to live lessons than I am. Um, he is here. Um, so Fabian will put, find that link for us. Um, Wow, an interesting question. D.S. Skaggs, I think, uh, is, there it is, there it is. D.S. Skaggs is saying, please explain the principles of pivot and guide fingers on the left hand. Do you know what the, that's in reference to? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, as I understand that uh, concept, uh, the guide finger is actually sometimes the finger that's actually going to direct you to the next place, on, you know, that you need to go. So if I'm up here, for example, my guide finger 
is really my first finger because I'm winding up, uh, and, and this is the soar etude I played earlier, sort of an excerpt in the middle. My first finger is actually guiding me to the next the position, land, yeah. which is first position. Um, or, you know, the, even in this piece where I'm, I'm being guided to the seventh position with that. Um, a pivot finger, um, as I understand the pivot finger, is sort of the, the transition between those two places, you know. Uh, do you know much about pivot fingers? Because I've not, I mean, I've heard the terms yeah. jotted around a little bit. I haven't really studied a, it or yeah, anything. So I, 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 guide finger is usually what I hear more frequently than the pivot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, and now, you know, I don't know if you're referring to it, but sometimes we use what we call um, a, uh, a bar, you know, like a, a bar that, like this where mm -hmm. we're actually just barring one string, mm -hmm. and then we kind of drop it down. But, yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, if someone was looking to get a classical guitar... Um, and get started in it, are there any particular types that you would recommend? Um, well, if, it depends on your hand size, really. I mean, if, if you have smaller hands and, and maybe shorter fingers, uh, that's going to limit the scale length that you want to invest in. Mm -hmm. You know, Like this guitar is a 650 scale length, which is pretty traditional. Um, oftentimes I get students that have bought by accident maybe a larger old Ramirez mm -hmm. that the the, um, the the scale length can be up to like 667 or 666 or 670 or whatever you know mm -hmm. and those guitars are really difficult to play um, for someone who has small hands so I always advise people because it, ju it just gets further down here and yeah. the frets get too wide yeah everything yeah. everything is you know larger um, I would it I would tell most people to start with a 650 they do make guitars that are like 647 648 for smaller hands but um, the other thing uh, you have to watch out for is just the action you know you want the mm -hmm. strings to be like this guitar is fairly high action so I can play into it but um, if you want you know uh, shorter accent uh, action you're actually going to have to not play as hard in the right hand mm -hmm. or the, the notes will cave out on you yeah um, there are some brands, if it, yes, I please, can mention, please. but I hate yeah. to. I don't, I, I don't endorse these, so I'm just yeah. giving you yeah, my yeah, advice. Just... Um, there's a guitar maker named uh, Cervantes uh -huh. that's in California. Uh -huh. um, he has, uh, I've had some students buy some really wonderful instruments uh, by him, and uh, he's always sort of my go to yeah. uh, luthier yeah. in the $1,500, $2,000 yeah. range. So. Yeah. Kenny Hill's another one, too. If uh, and a lot of it, as with anything, but especially with acoustic instruments, steel string, and even more so with a classical, um, it's all about the sound. It's, it's not even really as much about the dollar amount. Uh, it's about the sound. So find, find some classical guitars, nylon string guitars in your area that you like, that you enjoy playing, have someone play it for you, have, have the, the guy at the shop play it for you, and you stand back five, six feet and listen to it, hear how it sounds, have him play a couple different things so you can get an idea of how an instrument is responding to you. It's so much of it, um, they're not, I wish I could say they're all the same, but it's not. They, they could all come off the same line the same day, but some of them are going to sound different than others. And you really, I think, hit something very important is to be able to listen to the guitar, the classical guitar out in front of it, because behind it, I've had some guitars that I just thought were wonderful instruments, and then I get out in front of them mm -hmm. and listen to them. Like, oh, that's not so good after all. Yeah. yeah. So um, do get out in front of the guitar and actually listen to the sound that's being produced in front of the instrument. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now I know that one does not have a pickup in it. It is. Um, do you uh, work with guitars sometimes that have a pickup, and do you have a pickup that that you like for? Um, um, well, I think I went through that same phase that most classical guitar players do. Um, or just someone trying to, you know, amplify their instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I bought a couple of the, you know, Takaminis and all those, and they do, you know, an adequate job. Mm -hmm. But as more of a traditional classical player, I'm looking for the sound to be reproduced as closely as possible. Mm -hmm. So after a while, um, I broke down and bought a Kenny Hill mm -hmm. and actually uh, went ahead and put a, a bags pickup in it. It's mm -hmm. an element system. Mm -hmm. And uh, put that in there, and then I use an AER amp that uh, with those and a little bit more EQ, like a parametric, mm -hmm. as well as a wonderful digital reverb, yeah. it, it works pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it works so, pretty good. Yeah. 
Fantastic. All right, let's give something else away. Hey, I wanted to give away a, uh, this is a guitar polishing detailing cloth from our good friends over at uh, Music Nomad. We gave, uh, we had a sale on a lot of this stuff, gosh, I don't know, four, five, six months ago. And uh, this is a fantastic de guitar detailing cloth, kind of microfiber sort of things. All right, the winner of this is So Petty Cash Pie. So Petty Cash Pie. Uh, you send me your information at <clears throat> service at mightyoakmusic.com. FH Marshall, you can do the same for the, for the CD that you won earlier. And uh, we will send this out to you. Uh, and if you won something on last week's show or a week or two ago, forgive me. These things kind of all back up. I'll try and send them all out here in the next day or two. Uh, it's been busy. We've been filming a new course on um, these little warm-ups and workouts <clears throat> for speed and agility. Uh, for picking speed and agility, kind of getting out of classical mode here for a second, picking speed and agility. So I've been filming that for the last few um, uh, few days. So hopefully by next week, we'll be able to start uh, offering that. I'm really happy how that is turning out. Um, Racer2270 is saying, can someone break Steve's clock so <laughs> this lesson goes longer? I've had people often want to clean my clock, but that <laughs> never break my clock. Anyway, um, okay. Um, a couple of last minute questions. We have time for a couple of things. I see Case Notes is saying, in Hector Villalobos Etude Number no. 1, there's an E with a G sharp first position. Can you recommend a chord substitution for someone who can't reach the G sharp with their pinky? Wow. If you could get a little bit more specific with your question, perhaps we could not. <laughs> uh, do you happen to know? Yeah, he's talking, I think he's referencing this chord, you know, <laughs> which you're coming from here, and then you suddenly have to get, come up to this. Um, you know, there's really, I mean, I guess you could drop the G sharp. Some of my students have done that, but uh, I think the whole purpose of this etude is really to allow one to, you know, work on their stretch and their, you know, yeah. distance in the left hand. So I would... I would try to fight it out if you can and yeah. try to keep it in. Um, finger flexibility uh, is another one of the workshops I want to do. But uh, way back when, I used to have a lesson on Gibson.com, uh, uh, one of our skills house lessons on finger flexibility. And it, it talked about a, a Phil Kagi, uh, the Phil Kagi stretching exercise, which uh, you might look into that. I can't, can't do it too well on this guitar, but you have a major seventh form. Go down two frets with the first finger, one fret with the second, one fret with the third, one fret with the fourth, come back in, and you work your way down. The good news about finger flexibility uh, is that you can get better at it. It does, it does get better in time if you, if you work on it. So simple little exercises like that uh, Phil Kagi stretching exercise really does help. Uh, you do that every day for about three or four or five days, a week or two, uh, you'll definitely notice you've got another half inch or so of flexibility that you didn't have before. And you'll be amazed at how far that'll go when you're trying to reach for these crazy, yep. crazy uh, <laughs> chord shapes, yeah. uh, of which in classical, you just thought you were playing crazy chord shapes in jazz. Mm -hmm. It's in classical that it just goes off the charts. Um, but I'm amazed, you know, with some of these jazz players, you know, we had at our a guitar mm -hmm. conference many, many years ago, we had Martin Taylor. Right. Oh, what, what a brilliant player, but impeccable technique. Absolutely. Impeccable yeah. technique, right, right and left hand technique yep. as a jazz player. And just, He's yeah. one of the greats. I mean, you know, I've, I've seen him many times. In fact, we had him at Belmont maybe about five years ago, brought yeah. there by the Nashville Guitar Society. And um, yeah. Amazing musician and yeah. technician, you yeah. know, too. So, yeah, absolutely. Very good educator as well. Tom Moore is asking, What strings do you use and what does hard tension mean? What strings okay. are you using on that today? Well, I've got two different types of strings on this guitar right now. I have uh, Savarez Cantiga uh, high tensions uh, in the bass. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying those out. Um, and then I also have uh, the top are the Augustine Blue Label, uh, which again are high tension strings. Um, this guitar is only a couple years old, so I'm experimenting, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, so far, I kind of like the, the basses. Um, I used to use and kind of still really like Hanabach basses mm -hmm. and, uh, on some of my other classicals. But on this one, uh, I kind of like these uh, Savarez. Mm -hmm. And Savarez, those are available. I see those in music stores. 
Sometimes, I don't know if this particular set is available in music stores. I, I order a lot of my uh, strings through a, a website, so I never Which, which website do you uh, I go to Strings by Mail. Strings by Mail, yeah. yep. Great, great yeah. website. Good um, people. Good, good folks, they'll get mm -hmm. you your strings cheap and fast. So, yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk to us about hard and sure. soft tension and how that applies in classical guitar world. Um, well, hard tension strings actually, you know, sort of what it, it exactly what it, uh, how they describe it. Uh, the hard tension is tighter on, the, on, you know, there's not as much motion in the string when you're actually striking it. Yeah. So you actually can get a little bit more volume sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, um, every guitar is a little different. Uh, this guitar works relatively well with hard tension, although the medium tension strings uh, are nice too because the, the strings actually sometimes will resonate a little bit more, yeah. you know? But the hard string, the hard tension strings will give you a little bit more uh, volume, you yeah. know, and sometimes clarity. Now, the but I know some players prefer the soft tension. Is mm -hmm. that more of a flamenco thing, or? I think flamenco players do like the, the lower tension strings because, you know, you can, when you're, when you're doing the yeah. Roschiato, uh -huh. the strings will actually kind of flap up, you know, yeah. against the neck. You know, yeah. Like that. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Wow, I think we should break the clock and <laughs> go for it. No, no, no. It is such a fascinating discussion. All right. Wow. Okay, let's uh, land this ship. Let me give you a couple of uh, announcements, and then we will um, maybe... Do you have another piece to play for us, or do you want to... We can play our... We were kidding around as we were starting about doing a uh, little jazz piece, because not only does uh, uh, Robert do classical really well, but we can, uh, you know, fake a standard or two between <laughs> us. So we're going to try and do that. We're going to do the uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim's wave uh, here in just a moment. Just a few closing announcements. Let's give uh, one last thing away. Let's give away another um, another CD the of, of your duo. Yeah. Wow, there's so many songs on this 22 tracks 22 <laughs> tracks we we start started to make it shorter and we were like oh we love all these songs we just put them on. It's a... and it's great beautiful stuff um okay the winner of this is pick nerd pick nerd you have just won a cd um congratulations send me your information at service at mightyoakmusic.com your mailing address phone number things like that and we will get this out to you. If you're interested in the uh, classical guitar resources, check them out. Uh, we've got a new shipment of those coming in uh, probably tomorrow, and uh, it's great resources, good songs. If you're looking for songs to play, uh, you have instruction with the pumping nylon with a DVD. This comes with a couple of uh, CDs with it and lots of great tunes to get you started off with. Okay, uh, we will have a live lesson next week, which is May 18th, um, and we will be doing, we'll be learning another classical piece. Maybe we can even do that sore study. That would be a good one to do. I'll think about it. Um, thank you so much, Robert, yes, for being here you. with us. Yeah, what a joy it. to have you here yeah, with us. Wonderful. I have thoroughly enjoyed every note that you have played. <laughs> thank you. I wish we could do it more. Um, all right, and thank our wonderful team that is helping out tonight, our producer, Cole Gaines, and on camera, my wonderful son, Daniel Krenz. Of course, we cannot do it, any of this without Greg Voros from here at uh, Groon Guitars, the master himself. And uh, we'd also like to thank our extensive studio audience that we have with <laughs> us today. Uh, our good friend Dave White is visiting from Asheville, uh, North Carolina, and uh, he is down here. And if, if you are ever coming through Nashville, let, let me know. If you're coming through business or you're coming here uh, just through town, if you can give me a little bit of notice, call me, uh, send me, a, shoot me an email, and uh, we'll go out to lunch. We'll get the tour of Groons. You'll be amazed at how little it takes to get me and Greg to go out to lunch. So, um, and it's always a lot of fun. So if you're ever coming through Nashville, let us know. If you're ever coming through on a Tuesday night, you can be part of a live lesson. All right, here we go. Um, I guess my guitar's on. Um, hey, let's do uh, a little bit of uh, Wave. Let's do it.
<laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Hey, keep up the great work uh, on your own learning. We will see you next week. Have a good week of practicing, and uh, we will see you next time.